this morning. Picking up where we left off, which was halfway through the chapter about verse 22. Let's pray one more time, and then we'll get into the Word together this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, we're gathered in your name, gathered as our brothers and sisters are all over this world, gathered to honor you. Our desire, Lord, in gathering is to hear your voice speak to our hearts. And so, Lord, I, I just pray, and, and I know it's in agreement with my, my friends, my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that you would just help us to put aside any any thing in our life that's crowding in. Help us just, Lord, to, to focus on what you might have us hear from you, that you would minister to us from your word. We gather for that purpose, and we ask you to bless it, Lord. Bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it says in verse 22 of chapter 17, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And that makes sense. You know, they, they've enjoyed the ministry with the Lord. They've enjoyed walking with him. But if we read the account of this in Mark's gospel, uh, which is Peter's recollection, he says, you know, we really didn't know what he was saying to us. We really didn't understand what was going on. Certainly they're sorrowful. But see, Jesus so many times would speak to them in parables, and, they, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. So is he being literal here, or is he speaking in some sort of picture word here? We, we weren't really getting it, because we didn't believe that he was really going to die. We didn't understand why he needed to die. And yet, this is the second or third time where Jesus has said to them, I'm going to Jerusalem, and they're going to torture me and put me to death. But on the third day, I'll rise again. Well, you know, what reference point do we have? We, certainly they've seen torture, and certainly they've seen death. But what reference do you have for after three days, after three, only three days of going through that, you're going to rise up and walk? You know, so you can see why maybe they're a little perplexed. That's a little confusing. And yet Jesus wanted to instill that reality into their brain so that when it actually happened, you know, then they could go, oh yeah, he told us. That's what he was talking about. Now I get it. You know, I didn't get it when he said it, but I get it now. And, and so that's why he continued to share these things. But it's so hard to understand. I was thinking about this too. When you look at prophecy, when you look at what Jesus has said or what the, the prophets have said in, in the Old and New Testament, what they have shared with us about what will happen, those things that we know will happen. But you know, there's a lot of different opinion on how it will all turn out, how it will all occur. You know, there are people who say, well, the, the, Jesus is going to come again, but uh, the rapture that happens before is going to happen before this tribulation period that we read about. Some will say that, which I maintain. Others will go, well, no, I think about midway through which I totally disagree with that for many reasons. I don't want to go there. But, you know, you can see where people go. I can look at the scriptures they look at. I can see how they get what they say. And then there are others who say, at the end of the tribulation period, I don't get that one at all. But, you know, it's all things that are going to happen in the future. And so you, you only get a little picture of it. And so I can see maybe why the disciples were a little confused about that. Not really sure what he meant, because we're still not really sure what it means. What do we know really about heaven? We know enough to know I want to go there. <laughs> I know enough to know it sounds a pretty awesome place to be. No more pain or suffering, <coughs> tears, all that stuff. No sorrow. I think I want to go there. That's, uh, I'd like to try <coughs> there. That'd be awesome, you know. But the details of what it's going to be like. We, I... We have no reference point for that. So we can't really comprehend. I think if we could, we'd know more about it, but we just can't. You know, like Paul said, I saw things that I just, I don't have words to express. 
I can't relate to you. I went to heaven, I died, I saw heaven, but language is just too incomplete, too rudimentary to be able to communicate well what it is I saw. It was just inexpressible. Glory. It's an awesome place. So he shared that with them. And then they go on their journey. They come into that, into Capernaum, which is near part of Galilee. But in verse 24, it says, When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. <laughs> he said, yeah, he pays it. You know, it's kind of like, Yeah, what are my options here? Taxes. We don't even think about that this time of year, do we? <laughs> about time to pay the taxes, you know. The temple tax, though, it was just what you would think it would be for. The maintenance and the operation of ministry at the temple. And everybody, once a year, paid a, I don't remember how much, but paid a little bit of money to for a temple tax. It wasn't a severe burden on anyone. It didn't matter if you had a lot of money or a little money, you all paid the same amount, and it's just a tax. Just a, a small tax. But evidently at this point, Jesus and Peter, neither one of them had paid that tax yet. And so, so what's going on? Did your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter said, yeah, he pays. And I'm sure that's historically he had done that. And that's why Peter had that confidence. But you go on in verse 25, it says, And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? So think about this, Simon. From whom do kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Who should be paying this tax? Do I owe this tax, really? And, and, and he goes on to say, Jesus said to him, then this, uh, Peter said, from strangers, and Jesus said, then the sons are free. And I don't owe the tax. I mean, what dad charges his kid, you know, hey, son, the, uh, the taxes are due. Your share is $327. I need that by Friday because i got to send that in, you know. I mean, that's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, I see you like that, Jeff. I know. That's a great idea. However, we don't do that, right? And that's it. We're talking about God's house here. Jesus, the Son of God. So, so Simon, you know, do I really owe the tax? Is Dad going to take it from me? You know? The sons are free. Hang on to that one, Phil. The sons are free. You know, don't lose that verse. I, I'm seeing problems in your future. So. <laughs> Although, Anna, it only says sons. <laughs> but the sons are free. You know, in, in that idea that he doesn't owe it. But he goes on to say, nevertheless lest we offend. The, uh, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first, and when you have opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. Now ain't that odd. <laughs> what do you mean? Go, I mean, why couldn't he just flip him a quarter or whatever, you know? I mean, all right, maybe Jesus didn't. We know Judas held the money first. Maybe Judas wasn't there. Maybe he didn't have any coins in his pocket. I don't know, but a fish? A ball, I mean, why not walk down the street to the first apple tree that's in bird's nest there, and then there you'll get a coin. I mean, I, I wrestle with it. Why, why would he do that? Until I got thinking about Peter. You know, he's a fisherman. The guy likes to fish. And you consider where they've been, you know, as we've gone through the last few chapters. That was all recent history. They've had the feeding of the 5,000. Now, how did that occur, right? Jesus blessed the bread and the fish, and he gave it to the disciples to disperse to the people. Well, 5,000 people plus women, men plus women and children. So we figure 15,000, 20,000 people. If it's just the 12 of them carrying food to that many people, that's a busy day. So they carry all this food to nearly 20,000 people. You're running back and forth an awful lot, I'm sure. And you get down and everybody's done eating. Then he says, oh, but now go pick up what's left over. You know, so they have to go through and with the baskets and whatever, pick everything up. And then a few days later, 
with the 4,000. In between times, they've gone up to Tyre and Sidon. They've had some good hikes, you know. It isn't like they jumped on a plane and flew up there or took the train or anything, you know. They're walking, shoe leather express. So they've been busy. And then they've, uh, they had the ministry to the, on the um, Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. So they've been rowing boats back and forth across. And they had the transfiguration we talked about last week, so they've been mountain climbing a little bit. So, I mean, these guys have been busy. So they finally get back to home base in Capernaum. And we need a coin for these guys that are bugging us about taxes. You know, so it's like, hey, Peter, why don't you take the day off and go fishing? That's what that is. Why don't you have a break? And there is a time in our ministry where it's good just to have a day of rest, isn't it? even whatever we're doing. It's good to have those times of refreshing. And I think the Lord was being purposeful in, in what he sent Peter to do. Why don't you just go fishing? But the first one you catch, <laughs> look at his mouth, because he swallowed something for you. You know, and that when you when you're done, not only do you have a fish for lunch, you got a coin for the tax and you know, pay for me and for you and take care of it. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that sound like something the Lord would do? Just go fishing. It's okay. Rest for a day. Recharge your batteries a little bit. Because you know how life is. It's not always a, it's not a coasting. It's a struggle. And there are things that come at us and sometimes are more difficult than the others. And it's nice to have those times where you can just go and relax and do something you love to do. You know, people think, oh man, I'm going to be a Christian and I know God's going to ask me to do something horrible. You know, I'm going to have to go do this that I hate. He doesn't do that, you know. Go fishing, you know. Our ministry, and we all have ministry, whatever it is that we do, we do it, or we should be doing it, as unto the Lord, right? Whatever you do. So it's a ministry. And in doing that, he wants us to find joy in that. He didn't want to burden us. He isn't that dad, you know, well, uh, <laughs> Ethan one time, we, we had a clog in the sink. I wanted him to help me with that. <laughs> Just to gross him out. I mean, we do some of those things. You gotta do that. Pull that old slimy hair out of the sink. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? That's a good time. He was gagging. I loved it. <laughs> this is what you look, have to look forward to, my grandson. When you get older, you get to do this all by yourself. <laughs> he didn't last there long. He laughed. I don't know why. But you know, that isn't what the Lord does. I mean, there are times where you have to do stuff you don't like. Times where we have to do it. It isn't like you have to have, unclog a sink every day. You know, it isn't like we have difficulty. Most days are, the Lord blesses. Most, most days with easy things. Things we want to do. And that's his idea of ministry. He's not going to give any of us. Now, that doesn't mean that he won't change us. Because I told you before, I, I have terrible stage fright. Used to. And the very thought of standing up in front of anybody and talking, that was not me. That was never going to be me. You know, as, as the Lord had brought me along in my walk with him, what have we done? It's weird. I don't know. There's not even one butterfly in there. They're gone. I don't know what happened to them because there used to be a whole flock of them in there. You know? But how the Lord will change us and mold us and conform us to have us do what it is that he wants us to do. He has a ministry for us. He has a purpose for each one of us. But it's never going to be, oh. Although, like I said, 20 years ago, if you said, I'm going to be pastoring in church, no, that ain't happening. I'm not getting up in front of anybody and talking. You know, but how he's changed, you know. So if he does send you to that lost tribe in Africa that's, that, that are cannibals or whatever, you know, <laughs> Uh, either you won't taste good or something, I don't know, but you'll be okay, you know. You'll want to go that, there and do that thing. And that's what I get out of this, you know. Peter wanted to be with the Lord and he wanted to do ministry, but he loved fishing and he wants to go fishing. Just go have a day and enjoy yourself. So, that ends, we get into chapter 18, and then these guys being guys, you know how guys are. 
At that time, it says, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's a good question. <laughs> and you know it's motivated by certainly me, you know, whoever asked the question. We don't know who asked the question. It doesn't tell us who asked it. But you know these guys, they're always arguing over this. This is what they do. You know, the one upmanship that we have. Oh, and I love this answer. Then Jesus called a little child to him. Interesting that the little child wasn't afraid to come to him. Isn't that cool? He just picks a kid out. Hey, come here. And he comes up. And he set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What a picture, you know. Now, I get thinking about kids because we just had our grandkids. You know, they're really little mutants sometimes. <laughs> kids are a little rough at times. <clears throat> Especially siblings. I'm pretty experienced in that because I got four brothers and three sisters, so I, I get the sibling thing down. And I know who's the greatest, too, by the way. But, but you know how kids, that isn't what he's talking about. I say, all right, why have this reference to children as a picture of humility? Because that's what he's talking about. And I was thinking about when we, our kids were younger, because they're too old now. But when they were younger, we'd go camping. You know, the kids never wondered if we packed enough food or if we packed their, you know, they trusted. They, they weren't worried about that. They didn't care or know or, or even wonder. I wonder if they even knew we paid to stay at the campground. They didn't worry a thing about that. They weren't sitting there the whole time going, I wonder if Dad knows how to get us back home, <laughs> you know? You think of all the things that they, they trust us with as parents. They're not worried at all about what's for supper. Now, they may not like it, you know, that's kids being kids, but when you think of the, the trust that they have, that's what the Lord's speaking of here. You, you've got to be like a kid. So, the two steps here, the first one is converted, right? Unless you are converted. That means you used to be something, and then you're converted to be something else. We used to be lost, we converted and become saved. We used to be uh, our life marked by sin, now it's marked by serving. There's a difference, you know, we're converted, we're changed, and that's, that's always the first step. Being born again to a living hope. Being converted from someone on their way to hell to someone on their way to heaven that's that's quite a change isn't it so unless you're converted that's the first step guys that's the first thing we got to do people need to be converted but it's more than that it's also become there's a becoming we have to become something different than we were it's not these guys were wondering who's the greatest you shouldn't even be worried about that you shouldn't even be talking about that It's who can become as a little child? Who can become the servant of all? Who can humble themselves as a little child? That's the one that's greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. That's what it's stating there. The way we treat and, and understand, he's not just talking about children, though I love to use this for children, and this certainly is talking about them, but he's talking about the person who's converted and has become like a child. You can be almost as old as Leroy and do that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that can happen, you know? <laughs> Happy birthday again. You gotta have that on tape, see, that everybody knows it's your birthday. So. But converted and become as a little child, so that's who we are receiving. You know, as we treat each other, receives one little child like this in my name, receives me. You know, we have to see that Jesus in each other. We have to see God in all the people on the planet, really. You know, that he, he, we'll get to that in verse 25, but um, 
What are you, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. He says there. The responsibility we have to do good to all, but especially those of the household of faith. How we need to care for one another. And so he makes that point there. He goes on from there, though, and says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's a pretty graphic <coughs> picture, isn't it? Now, I've never tried swimming with a millstone around my neck. I'm thinking it's not too successful an endeavor. I'm thinking you get down pretty quick, you know. And I don't know which millstone. They have the little ones, you know, like a cinder block maybe. That'd be tough because you think about around your neck, you know. I kind of breathe through there. You know, oxygen's good. And you try to stay above water, but you have something tied around your neck that drags you down. But most likely, it's the big millstone. Weighs about a half a ton or so. I mean, he's pretty serious about this. About not leading people into sin. Whoever causes one of these little ones, and especially when we're talking about children, but also when we're talking about someone that's just converted, somebody that's a new Christian, but even old folks like us who've been saved a long time, it becomes harder to draw us into sin. We've learned more. We've dealt with things more. But still, temptation is a reality. It still could happen. It still does happen. I'm still not perfect. Oh, well, will that happen, you know? It doesn't happen until we're there and back. But it's one thing to be tempted, it's, and it's one thing to commit a sin, but what a different thing it is to take someone and bring them with you into your sin. You know, whoever causes one of these ones who believe in me to sin, you cause somebody else to do something that you know and that they know maybe, but most likely contrary to God's will for them. What a horrible thing that is. That's a serious offense. So you'd be better to go swimming with a, with a ton of a millstone around your head in the middle of the sea. And, and see, to them, I mean, we know a little bit more about the sea now than they used to. That To them, I mean, whatever went down never came up. That was a scary place. It, there was a lot of fear. I still have a little bit of fear about deep water myself. But there's fear, legitimate fear about that. But it'd be better for you to do that, to die quickly in the depths of the sea than to cause someone to sin. And woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come, or the sin. You know, woe to the world, first of all. The world has been judged and will be judged. Woe. Woe to them, but woe to the man by whom the offenses come. And then he's talking about sin. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. That's pretty radical. I don't think he's necessarily being literal, because you see, the problem, if I cut my hand off, it, see, it, it, the reason it has a problem is attached up here. It's, it, it's up here. You know, sin begins up there. It's a thought. And I can't cut my head off. That just ain't going to work well. But to show how serious it is, especially in that culture, in an agrarian society, you have to be out working. You have to be farming or fishing or you know, working off the land. You need your hands. You need your feet. But if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Hell is so horrible. Do whatever you can, whatever you have to, to avoid it. But think about this, you know, feet. What does feet do? Feet take us places, right? Don't go there where you're gonna be tempted to sin. Don't go, don't walk in that direction. And if you have to cut your foot off so you don't go there, but you know, flee temptation. Don't put yourself in a place where you're tempted. 
Be wise. Stay away from those things. And your hands, you know, they do. They're the things that do things. You know, so our feet carry us there so that our hands can do the things that our eyes are seeing. The things we see that we shouldn't see. Nowadays, though, we don't really need our feet as much because now we can sit and open our computer. We can go anywhere with just our fingers. And we can see anything with our eyes. Everything is available without even leaving home. Isn't that wonderful? But don't go there. Don't do that. Don't use these things for sin. See, these hands were made to glorify the Lord. These eyes were made to look upon his creation and see him and everything that we can see. And these feet are given to us that we may go and share what God has shown us. That's the purpose of them. It's not to go and do these things that cause us to sin, these things that ultimately destroy us. Because that's, that's why God says don't sin. You know that. We know that. Because he loves us. And he wants what's best for us. The same way that we, toward our own kids, we don't want them to do things that are going to hurt them. They may see us being harsh. No, you have to go to bed at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, whatever it was with my grandkids. I don't want to go to bed. Too bad, go to bed. Because otherwise, you're not going to sleep right. And you know what happens the next day when you got to get them up to go to school. I don't want to get out. You know, it, it just causes it compounds. You know, all these things. So we, we want them to be obedient, not because we're harsh, not because we're mean. And that's the same way it is with the Lord. He does these things because he knows what's best for us. He tells us how to live because he wants us to be happy. He wants us to be blessed. He goes on to say in verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. So, you know, guiding angels, that whole idea, I, I, I certainly believe I have angels. I certainly believe that I keep them busy. I know that, you know, it's good for them. I, I want to make sure they're well exercised, you know. <laughs> and I, I'm glad that it's plural, you notice that? It's, they're angels, plural. I don't know how many are assigned to me. Sometimes I wonder if a few of them are on vacation, though. I mean, some of the things that happen, but... But God is looking out for us. God's desire is for us. And Jesus here in verse 11, his mission statement, you know, he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his mission statement there. His purpose in coming. Save that which was lost. And then he says this again, like he said to Peter, what do you think? You know, that, that's a lost art in our day and age. People don't think a lot. We are so amused by so many things. Amused. Muse means think, right? Amuse means not think. And that's what an amusement park is, a place to go and not think. But we have so much amusement, so many things that distract us. And just, you know, what a wonderful thing just to sit and to muse, to think, to open the word and look at it and say, Lord, show me what it is. This means, how do I apply this word to my life? So he says, then, what do you think? Think about it. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, if surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. See, God is watching out for them. If you do lead them astray, he's going to go after them. And what a joy if he, they are restored to the, to the fold. You know, the one that has run away, the one that has wandered off. You know, what a, what a joy. But notice this. You know, it isn't like God comes along and says, You stupid sheep, what were you thinking? Why did you run away? You know, no. See, when we return, when we're restored, what's he do? He rejoices. You know, the heart of the Lord. It's not condemnation. God never condemns. Never, ever, ever. You know, he doesn't do that. He will convict us. 
which is him trying to make us sorrowful for the things that we've done we shouldn't have, in order to draw us back into a right relationship with him if we stray. That's his hindering conviction. But he never condemns us. He never puts us down. I love that. Because his desire, isn't that cool? His will. You know, people say, I wish I knew God's will. This is one of those places where he says, this is the will of your Father in heaven, that one of these little ones should not perish. That's one of those places. What's God's will? He wants us to live forever with him. Isn't that awesome? Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So if somebody is trying to drag you into sin, or someone is doing something that they ought not to do, and you're aware of it, he says, just, look, just go talk to him. Just get together. And, and don't broadcast it. This is not an occasion to let everybody know that you were bugged by something. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you will gain your brother. See, keep the circle small. Oftentimes, what has happened is a misunderstanding, right? And if you go and you talk it out, you find out, oh, I thought you meant this. Oh, you meant that. I didn't see that. And you can, you know, you can rectify the thing. But, you know, it goes on in verse 16. If you will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So, all right, if, if, if there's a conflict and you can't resolve it, find somebody you trust. Some of you know that isn't going to broadcast it to the whole world as well. Go and grab them and say, look, could you help me? I get this problem. I need to go talk with this guy again, or they're not listening to what I said. This is what I saw. This is what they said. And, and so just maybe I'm wrong, maybe he's wrong. Can you come and just listen to it? And can we see if we can solve that? So that, that's the next step. You widen the circle a little bit. The idea is you're trying to protect each other, you're trying to protect everybody. You don't want anybody to get, you know, put down. <coughs> so you get to two or three that go, and if he refuses, verse 17, to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So tell it to the church is not in front of everybody we announce. Well, I got to tell you what Jean did to me the other day. You know, we don't do that. <laughs> First of all, it's a long list. And it's not <laughs> but, but you know, you tell you tell it to the leadership of the church. That's the idea. So the guys in charge, the Lord has put in a position of authority in the church, and let those guys know. Look, this is what's been going on, and so. You know, you call them in maybe to the group of leaders, and that's that's typically in church discipline, that's what you would do. You know, you keep it small, you try to deal with it yourself, then you include maybe a couple other people, and that's not happening. So then you get the leadership of the church together, and you hear the case. And again, it's all trying to protect everybody's reputation. You don't want anybody to be harmed beyond what they should be. But if they won't hear that, then you treat them like a tax collector we don't like those guys, do we? <laughs> or a heathen. No, we do. What do we do with tax collectors and heathens? We pray for them. We try to demonstrate Christ to them. We try to win them. It isn't we go at them with clubs and spears. It isn't that we gossip about them. It isn't that we do any of those things that some people tend to do and that churches, unfortunately, have been known to do. But our goal still, it doesn't change. We want to win them. But the difference is we no longer have the same level of fellowship. Because what fellowship is there? You know, light with darkness. How can you do that? You can't have fellowship with them. Because they're rejecting the authority that God has put in their life with their friend, with their group of friends, or with the church. They continue to reject all that. Well, how can you have fellowship with them? Then? But that's still the goal. You pray for them. And so that, that's the idea here. In verse 18, Assuredly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. 
You know, I, that's one of those verses that's been taken maybe a little too far. And I really, how I look at this, um, we got rules. We as a church here have rules. Our rules might be different than First Baptist or Harrington or any other church in the area. It might be a little different. This is how we do things. And what we accept, God says, okay, that's the way they do things. If you don't like it, that's too, you have to go somewhere else maybe or something. Or, or maybe you do like it and you're here, whatever. But it's okay to set up rules. He's giving some level of authority to his disciples to choose how they want to order their service, how they want to worship God. And God said, that's awesome. That's good. That's what he's saying there. Whatever you want to do. If you bind it, if you say, no, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're the church of the necktie. So everybody, has, all the guys have to wear a tie. There are those churches out there. That's okay. But they won't be like that. I've been to the church of the cutoff jeans. You know, it's okay. You know, if that's what the rule is there, it's fine, right? You know what I mean? There's so many rules that people can make, and all a little different. It's just it's, it's just stuff. It's just thing. You know, it's no big deal. So that's how I take that verse. Um, there are things we do have to agree on, though. You know, like, like the Ten Commandments, those are still in effect. Those are still pretty true. You know, that we ought to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, that we should have no idols, um, that we should not lie, murder, steal, any of those things. I mean, those are, those are common. And we have to agree on certain tenets of faith, which are in the Word, you know, that Jesus is the Son of God and that, you know, His Word is inspired. There's a lot of things that we, we will hold to to have fellowship with somebody else. But there's a lot of things that is flexibility. And, that, and that's how I take that verse. And then we'll close with uh, verses 19 and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's quite a promise, isn't it? So what is not included in anything? <laughs> is there anything not in anything? <laughs> right? If two or three agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean we can get together and say, Lord, we agree that we ought to have, and you know, and, and we're feeding our own selfish desire. That's not what he's talking about. But if we get together and we're praying, God, we really want you to move in our lives. We want you to move in our community. We want you to, you know, he's not going to answer that prayer with a no. You know, when our prayer is lined up with his will, we can be confident that he's going to answer that prayer. We can be confident in that. And that's what he's saying. If two or three of you, you know, it doesn't take 40 or 50, isn't that cool too? Just two or three, and in many, agree on anything they ask. It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. We're gathered in his name, his authority for his purposes. Imagine that. He's here with us this morning. God is with us. That's awesome. And whenever we get together, you know, in our homes, with our friends, families, if we're gathered in his name, if we open his word, or if we're just talking about his word, we're sharing with one another, that's why he's listening in. He's with us. He's among us. That's a, that's a nice thing. You know, when you think about the back there with the 99, you know, that he leaves the 99 he, to pursue the one, you know. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's with us. He's for us. What an awesome God. And he loved us so much that he did send his son to die for us. That really happened. God became flesh. He put on flesh. He walked among us. He lived the perfect life that we can't live so that he could die the death that we deserve so that he could pay the price for our sin and three days later rise again. Two weeks, isn't that amazing? Two weeks until the whole world celebrates it. We celebrate it all the time. And we're celebrating it this morning with communion. So brothers, if you'll come, we'll share communion this morning. 
But just think of God's great love for us. I wanted to read Hebrews chapter 9 this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion. And just to remember, because that's what Jesus asked us to do. This is just a remembrance. There's no magic potion here or anything. It's just the emblems of remembrance. But in Hebrews 9 verse 11, it says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. We got a future that's so much better than even now, even though God has blessed us now. He came as a high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. See, the, the temple in Jerusalem was a picture, was a symbol of the real one in heaven. Not made with hands, not of this creation. And not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Once for all, he paid the price for sin. Once for all. Having obtained eternal, I like that word too, doesn't run out, eternal redemption. He's paid the price forever. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. He paid it all. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal, that word again, eternal inheritance. What a good God we have. It is good that we remember him. So let's do that now. thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the chance to <clears throat> remember what you did for us, Lord, for dying on the cross, for breaking your body, Lord, for, for doing all those things, Lord, throughout the, the years that you spent on earth, Lord, just to, just to show us, Lord, just to give us a better way, to give us a way out, Lord. We just thank you for that. We just thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. And Lord, we pray that you would just help us to remember this, Lord, not just today, but, but every hour, every day, Lord, <clears throat> we would know what you did for us. Let's remember that his body was broken for us. He paid the price we could not pay.
communion as we do join together. To remember what you did for us on that cross. The shedding of your precious blood <coughs> cleanses us from sin. Lord, washes us clean. Mm. Help us to remember what Jeff said just, just every day as we go forward to remember to tell others and to explain why we follow you, Lord, and why we so appreciate all you did on that cross. Thank you for all you provide. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to to bleed and die on that cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Forgiveness. That's what this is about. We've been forgiven. Wiped clean. Slate is clean. Let's remember. Let's stand. We'll sing, Bless Be the Tide. Then him, he's going to close us in prayer. Bless us, each and every one of us, as we leave today. Give us a safe trip home, please, until we meet again in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. <clears throat>